Welcome everyone to our 113th uh, AIM Sports webinar. Since we started these back in March of 2020, this is the 39th of 2021. We've, uh, we've been having just a fantastic time, built uh, just tons and tons of great material for those, those folks that are trying to learn a little bit more about data acquisition and, and the, the data analysis side and, and tons of very technical um, uh, webinars that we've been doing that to help everybody understand, the, you know, the basics and plus, of course, the button pushing of the AIM software. Uh, today's going to be one that we've uh, that that is not quite exactly quite so technical, and I and I and I love them. I love when we're able to do these. I think we've done seven or eight different ones where we've had either authors or or special guests that have come in and talk about their motorsports and not necessarily uh, much at all to do with data data acquisition and data analysis, although we may touch into a little bit of that today. I'd like to welcome our, uh, a guest that we have here today that um, uh, by the name of Jade Gerst. Jade wrote a book called um, Beast, the top secret Ilmore Pinsky engine that shocked the racing world at the Indy 500. 1994 was the year that they, uh, that, 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 that this, uh, uh, the, the Beast ran. And then I, uh, what, what year did the, the book come out, Jade? uh 2014 2014 so was, yeah, and uh so 20 20 years it took a while to put that uh, put that story together right so let's uh, <laughs> yes. uh, uh let's introduce jade a little bit deeper and then uh and then we'll just kind of chat about the book a little bit he's he's done six other books he's uh, a two-time new york times best-selling author uh, as of now more i'm sure on the way but he's got uh, such a deep background that is that I always find that I find so interesting and and uh, gives him such a depth of ways to be able to 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 find stories like this and understand them and put them together and and bring in the people that he uh, that he did, which we'll talk quite a bit about. But a publicist for some of the big players, right? Anheuser Busch, Mercedes Benz, Mazda, many many of the major um, motorsports sponsors was a publicist for Dale Jr., Dale Earnhardt Jr. from 1999 to 2007, kind of that heyday of, uh, I believe uh, that was the Budweiser era for him. Maybe he'll, yes. uh, he'll, he'll chat about that a little bit more. The, um, uh, and then, uh, of course, the marketing and communications director for Ilmore Engineering, then racing engine division of Mercedes-Benz, you know, a, a pretty powerful uh, and, and daunting uh, task there as well, obviously. Uh, uh, Director of Corporate Communications for Andretti Autosport and Andretti Sports Marketing. I, I think a lot of people don't understand that there's the that there's those two things there, and that Andretti Sports Marketing is a is a huge operation and very uh, and, and does just a ton. And uh, that's pretty cool that you were involved in that. Native of Topeka, Kansas, where uh, many of us have been and uh, and ran uh, you know the uh, around the SCCA side, and then of course the the Topeka uh, Motorsports Park there, and uh, and ran some races there as well. So thank you, Jade, for coming. I appreciate it. There's a little bit of a background on you. Um, give us anything else that you uh, you think might be relevant here to. Uh, let our folks know. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, the invite. And great to be here to chat with everyone. Um, if it's loud and goes fast, there's a probability that I've, I've worked with it or worked on it. Uh, so uh, I enjoy all the different forms of motorsports. So I uh, actually grew up around dirt tracks, uh, huh. sprint cars and midgets were my original love and still close to my heart and uh, uh, then Indy cars and uh, just happened to slip into the, the NASCAR side with with Budweiser and Dale Jr. And then uh, recently with with Mazda on their professional side uh, when it was the Mazda Road to Indy and then the Mazda prototype program in IMSA and uh, thrilled to be able to write books and tell stories and uh, share uh, share some of the great moments in in racing history so i was happy to yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it, coming from Topeka, I yeah. uh, I had a uh, my, my oldest brother lived in the area at Emporia actually uh, for oh, a yes, while, sorry. and um, uh, and as he moved there and, and started, we started chatting back and forth. Motorsports was really big is really big in that area, and uh, he said he could go to uh, you know three or four nights a week he could go to a dirt track and watch uh, dirt track racing. So I uh, there's no surprise that you uh, uh, that would have been an early place that you got involved in motorsports. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How do you make that? Um, you, you made that uh, that path in motorsports, as you as you mentioned. Uh, but 
from that publicist role and working on that side of, of motorsports, how, how did you make, you know, to keep this kind of tied together with the book side for a little bit, how, how do you make that leap to being an author? Is, is that something you had um, training in, skills, um, just met I, some people, did something? How did that work out? The, the simplest answer is nobody told me no. <laughs> um, I actually, my, my education background is in broadcast production okay. and um, when I uh, I was hired by Budweiser to, to run the PR uh, for the Dale Jr., the Budweiser NASCAR program. My original idea was to help produce a, a documentary uh, uh, or behind the scenes of uh, what was then a rookie NASCAR driver. I thought, what well, how amazing to get his first Daytona 500 uh, and so on. We never imagined that he would go out and win in his seventh start and win the all-star race and all of that. Well, that was 2000 and an era where unlike today, reality TV really hadn't taken hold and uh, no one was willing to write a check to produce uh, produce a, a documentary or produce a, a, a behind the scenes uh, show. And I had uh, taken uh, voluminous notes everywhere we went, whether that was uh, on the racetrack, uh, at Dale Jr.'s appearances, uh, any of the other elements of, of life. And uh, about halfway through the season, I, I had all this material and I thought, well, we need to do something with it. So Dale Jr. and I uh, decided, hey, let, let's, let's do a book. Let's write a book. And uh, like I say, no one said no. We started working on it. And uh, uh, that became uh, driver number eight. And, and uh, so now, 20 uh, some years later, uh, I'm somehow still going on, on writing the books. Yeah, a lot of work, I suppose, right? But uh, w w once you do it, uh, it it's, uh, it's something to be proud of and something that you've, you've put kind of into history, I suppose. So. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a very uh, solitary endeavor, I'll say, but uh, particularly here during the, the uh, pandemic, uh, I was able yeah. to do the, the John Andretti book uh, with John before he passed, and then now uh, an Alan Sir Jr. book. So uh, it's definitely been uh, very rewarding uh, during these tough times to really have big projects to, to work on. I want to talk about those last two here to, after we chat a little bit about uh, about about the beast and and, sure. and that side. But I, I uh, the the Al Unser Jr. book uh, actually being released on Friday, you know, just uh, yes. a few days away. So it's a uh, good timing for us to chat a little bit about that one as well. The yeah. um, the, the, the kind of kind of backing up a little bit, you have that role of um, of, of of publicist, right? And uh, and because of that, you you meet you know tons of people. It's it's in your nature anyway, I suppose. And um, how did the um, uh, that that conversation of starting the the gathering of information uh, uh, for the beast uh, actually start for you? Well, uh, in 94, obviously, they had uh, this top secret engine that ended up winning the pole and the race, dominated the race. I was there as a fan, uh, purely as a fan. I, I went to the 500 year after year. And then several years later, I uh, was able to work initially with Mercedes-Benz uh, of North America, uh, and then directly with Ilmore Engineering. So um, I kind of knew about the engine, but we would go to uh, team dinners at, you know, at, at races, and uh, some of the guys would have a drink or two, and the stories would start <laughs> flowing about, uh, about this amazing engine. And it, just, it was just so vivid, such a great story, and so many twists and turns uh, that it in the back of my mind, it, I always felt like this is a story that, that someone needs to tell. And uh, I actually, I, I, uh, Paul Morgan, who is the Moor of Ilmore, uh, collected World War II vintage planes. And sadly, in 2001, uh, was killed uh, flying one, one of his uh, planes. And I, I was terribly sad because I thought that, that pretty much killed the idea of, of a book. I just felt like Paul was such an integral yeah. part of it. I, I was sort of discouraged. 
but I had become close with his son, Patrick, who also is an engineer. Patrick and I stayed in touch. And one day, Patrick, just an offhanded comment said, I, I would love to know what my dad was doing and what was involved in creating that engine. And it was just like uh, enough to push me over that cliff, like on a <laughs> roller coaster. I'd had that long, slow ride up for years and years. And and no Patrick's stopping it when you went over the top. Yeah, huh? Exactly. <laughs> once, once I sort of tipped over the edge. Um, and again, with Patrick's help, he was immensely helpful um, in helping me with interviews. I spent several weeks in England and uh, a lot of time here in the U.S. with interviews. Patrick became my uh, technical advisor. Oh. Um, I had what I called the MOM rule, which uh, when I went to Europe, uh, in England became the MUM rule, which meant if my mom didn't understand it, I had to rewrite it. I didn't want the book to just be limited to um, engineers and mechanics. Uh, I wanted it to be a, a story that people could identify with. And, and so, uh, so it, you know, it wasn't just a technical telling of how this engine was uh was uh, construed and, and created. So uh, it's funny. That's it's how funny. It kind of got started. It's funny that you say that. Is 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 I I bought the book when it first came out uh, years ago, and um, and and still have it right. And and of course, the last couple of days I've been thumbing through and and uh, and and refreshing my memory on some things. But one of the things that caught uh, caught my attention is is it's it's not just a racing book and and uh, and some people will you know, maybe in our in our motorsports uh, audience may get turned off by that but it is a racing book it, there are all the technical details that are in there but what is so cool about it is it's written to the point where you, you talked about your mom or you know whoever could read it. It, it it is a story and it's getting from here to here and it's and it's the tech it's the technical details but woven in there is is the hundreds of people and the hundreds of efforts and, and all these tasks that are coming together most of the time secret from each other or not known by many of them uh, uh, need to, you know, need to know kind of a information and weaves it all together in, in, in a, in a very fine story. And I think that that's what makes it such a, uh, such a, a book that when you pick it up and start reading it, it, it is a chapter by chapter, you know, you can't sit it down kind, kind of a book. And I hope, that uh, if, if folks haven't read it, that they take a, um, a minute and grab a copy and, uh, and, and read about it. It is such a powerful uh, way of telling a story, but, but such a big piece of uh, that motorsports mentality of just, you know, hey, we've got an idea, let's, uh, let's go with it. I really enjoy the way that you, that you put it together. Well, thank you. It, it means a lot. I've, I've had people tell me that, uh, while this could be a, a business book on how to do a, a big project, some people have said, oh, it's like a spy novel because of how they kept everything secret exactly. and all the tricks and things. Uh, and it, it's a racing book. It's about uh, going out and uh, getting to that finish line ahead of, uh, of all the others. And uh, it has that essence of all great racing stories. So uh, it was very much my intent when I, wrote it that that be be the case yeah very much hit that sweet spot of uh the intrigue and the uh but yet having that motorsport stuff that keeps me my attention in every yeah. step of the way and the and not only the successes but the failures and and so and so vividly written that um when the when another push rod fails right you, you there's uh there's the whole okay well now what do we do right there is no there is <laughs> yeah. no backing up let me give a couple yes. of dates here just to, to even set the the tone a little bit for, and then we'll talk a little bit deeper but um the uh the design they sat down uh, as i've read through the book a little reread a little bit um july of 1993 you know uh the Paul Morgan, Mario, and Roger Pinsky sat down and had that discussion, and uh, and over a handshake and a and a bottle of wine, decided that yes, this is what we're going to do. Uh, July 1993, right? And then the engine. Then they they started to put. Um, uh, that was June of 93. I'm sorry. Design 
pin on paper, not a whole lot of computers back then, uh, pin on paper design started in July of 1993, the, less than a month after, you know, them uh, uh, deciding this was something they were going to do at, at uh, I think, a cart race in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, when they were all together at, at dinner. Engine first ran January of 94, right? So, so five or six months after <clears throat> pin hit paper, they, uh, the, the first engine ran on the, on the dyno. That's, uh, that's pretty crazy. Tons of more work, public inter publicly introduced just a couple of weeks before the Indy 500 in May of 94. And then, uh, and of course, then the, the race day of uh, the end of May, May, May 29th. The, um, a couple of things that are really interesting, and, and so you don't have to maybe chat about them. One of the, they had design criteria, right? There was uh, the, this engine that fit a special set of rules that USAC had put into place that allowed two valve push rod motors to have a larger engine size, uh, more boost. Um, they had done it for stock blocks to come in and to try to give the small guy a little bit of a shot. And, uh, and a lot of people were looking at it and, and, and uh, Mr. Pinsky was the one that pulled the trigger, but the, the goal was it was a one race deal. The rest of the series didn't have that rule. So it had to fit into their standard car. So they had, constraints of uh, lengths and bolt patterns and and they needed all the hoses and wires and, and and all that stuff to hook up so all of that was constrained then they had to build this special one-off engine inside of that which makes uh you know the some of the stuff wasn't quite uh, quite that easy right so um the other the other date that is interesting to me is they started testing and uh, i'd love for you to talk a little bit about the testing program but that thing ran, like I said, first started uh, January of, of 1994. It took until May 8th. Now they're at the, at the Indy 500 doing their normal practicing you know, the month of May. They're off still running this thing in cars at other, at other test tracks. It didn't make a 500 mile run successfully. It, you know, it uh, continued to break and blow up. The, uh, it didn't make a successful 500 mile run until May 8th. Uh, you know, 20, 20 some days before the Indy 500 when it actually finally made 500 miles without breaking. So um, uh, there's a lot of drama built into the, into the, not built into the story as part of the story. And, uh, and you continued to capture that, which was, uh, which was really great. Anything um, uh, about that testing, you know, the, the, there was a bunch of testing that you, you, you chat about uh, the drivers, different drivers uh, were doing different things. Talk a little bit about that side of it and that part of the program. Oh, I mean, yeah, the, some of the test stories are some of my favorites. Uh, the very first test, uh, at that time, Roger owned the, the Oval at Nazareth, Pennsylvania. He also owned Michigan International Speedway. So the first test was at Nazareth. And if you know that area, you know it's not always so pleasant uh, in winter. It's Pennsylvania. They, <laughs> yeah, they had to uh, clear the track, and they had snow banks uh, up to eight feet uh on either side of the track and the pit lane uh so you had alan Tr jr was the first driver in he says it's the first time he's worn a snowmobile suit while in in the race car <laughs> uh and um uh, you know basically would would run that the crew could not see the car unless they climbed atop the the snow banks or on top of the uh the trailer there, so they did did an immense amount of training or uh, testing in very uncomfortable situations. Uh, Paul Tracy did a lot of the test driving. One of my favorite anecdotes was uh, Paul and Al. Both of their feet would get so cold because your feet are so exposed in in an Indy car. And with Paul, they decided they were going to take the little uh, uh, shock cover off and use a, a heat gun to keep his feet warm. And without anyone realizing it, it, it set his boots on fire. It began to melt his, his driver boots. So uh, they kind of had to put that out and get him going again. But uh, it's just, it's a lot of those little anecdotes from the, the test sessions. The other aspect is um, they would have failures and immediately they would take the engine apart in, right in the garage, whether it was at Nazareth or in Michigan, and, uh, you know, usually you would do your sort of forensic analysis back in the shop where it's warm and clean and sterile, and they didn't have the luxury of time to do that. So they would have to take these engines apart and literally in freezing temperatures, try to determine which element failed first. It's like recreating a plane crash to try to analyze the wreckage. 
to pinpoint the cause. And then they would be on the phone with uh, Ilmore in England, which would then work all night to improve whatever part broke uh, and then ship it back to Penske uh, immediately. It was an amazing 24 hour a day effort, uh, not a day, not a moment to lose. So that really made every day, every moment, every test lap uh, critical and important. It's it, it, again an exercise in in project management like like no other because it's um, um, that end date that May twenty nine race day it it doesn't move right so you could have these problems yes. but and and it was very clear in the book that everybody there had that attitude it was uh, uh, j- just fix it right and uh, yes. the uh, you got to get okay it broke you next you figure out what went wrong the other thing that I think is inter- so interesting is it's nineteen ninety three there isn't we don't have a, a, a phone, a smartphone in our hand and we're texting images back and forth and reports, right? This is a, yes. they're, they're having to make phone calls or they're having to fax things or, you know, whatever it happens to be, right? The technology is not like it was. Uh, uh, this task was made even harder by, by technology. Kind of interesting. Yeah. And, and they spent a lot of time on that, on the communication. How do we maximize the time we have available? Again, Ilmore, uh, the headquarters uh, is in Bricksworth, England. So you had a huge time difference, um, but in an odd way, it gave them sort of uh, more than 24 hours because you had England working on one time schedule. You had Penske, which was then based in Reading, Pennsylvania, working on an, on sort of the you know Eastern time zone. So uh, again, it was about managing communications, managing every moment uh, to, to maximum effect. Uh, I mentioned earlier, Paul Morgan collected World War II planes. There were days when they would run late and they would have to pack parts into the old um, uh, ammo bay, bays of Paul Morgan's P-51 Mustang. <laughs> and he would rush the parts to Heathrow where they would place it on the Concorde before it flew that morning to the U S. So, I mean, it, it's stuff that you couldn't make up. If I yeah. wrote this as a fictional uh, <laughs> book, people would kind of scoff, but the, the real stories are amazing and so much better. And from what I, what I picked up in the book at the parts writing on the Concorde was not uh, it was not a one-time thing. Yes, very, <laughs> very frequently uh, using you, that Concord to get things to and from. Can you imagine that, uh, you know, the, the, the I'll, I'll call it the budget, but, uh, you know, they're really, uh, at, at some level, the, the, there wasn't a budget, but uh, the amount of money yes. that was spent is amazing. The yes. um, uh, Bruce asked a question over here. <clears throat> he says, I, I could be wrong. I believe it was based on the V6 Buick. And uh, uh, let me throw in just a second and then let you kind of take care of that. But the, yeah. a lot of people were using the, the V6 Buick as, a, as that stock block or a, a, a motor that had a two valve push rod motor. And, uh, and Penske, and from what I've read in here, that they, they, they noticed that uh, you know, they were worried about Honda and, and, and Chevrolet and other ones taking that little uh, narrow gap in a rule that uh, that the V6 Buick was using and and building something very powerful. And Penske was just uh, the only one that pulled the trigger and did it, but he was really worried about other people doing it and then beating him at that game, right? Yeah, that's really what precipitated it. Um, the, the rule itself from the Speedway had been around a couple of years and you had said it earlier, it was to help the little guy uh, to, to come to the speedway with, uh, you know, basically what was technically a more simple engine. Um, and, um, so the, the Buick V6 utilized those rules. It was, it was very fast, no doubt, but it was based on purely a stock block engine. So it was, uh, as reliable as a wet piece of paper. Uh, and they eventually took the word stock block out of the rule, which meant Penske and, and Ilmore's ears perked up that, hey, we can build a specific racing engine to match these rules. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, Honda was coming into the sport in 94, coming to IndyCar for the first time. Ford Cosworth was heavily involved. Ilmore had raced against Honda in Formula One. And I think the, the fear of Honda is part of what made Roger and uh, the Ilmore guys say, we, we've got to do this now. We have to do it secretly 
so that Ford and or Honda doesn't, uh, they don't do the same thing and leave us uh, in the dust. So it was uh, both an, an idea that had engineering merit, but it was also the fear of, of Honda coming aboard that, that made them, you know, sort of pull the trigger and say, uh, yes, this is, uh, you know, this is what we need to do and do it now and do it yeah. secretly. Yeah, very interesting that, you know, Roger Pinsky always has that unfair advantage uh, concept, right? Always searching for that. But in, from what I have read and chatted with some others as well, it's, uh, it was as much as he's, he was nervous as other people doing it, right? So while it's been, yes. um, the lore of this is that, uh, that he took advantage of the, the, the unfair advantage. It was just as much that he was concerned about somebody else might, and he would be the one sitting in the, in the back seat with a, you know, a couple of 200, 250 horsepower less than the, than the rest of them. Yes. So a absolutely yeah, in interesting. The, um, as, as we kind of move forward, the, um, uh, they, they, they work on the engines. There was one key moment that is just intriguing to me is the, um, uh, the that I'll, I'll set the table for you. Maybe you can finish it up. They were, they were, they had started the engine. It was begin, you know, they were on testing, they were running them on dynos. They were looking at power numbers and, uh, uh, and they couldn't break through, right? They, they were stuck at that 850, 820. I don't remember the exact numbers, but the, their, yeah. their goal being 950, 970. And, um, uh, and they were kind of stuck there and they, uh, and there was a, a, a junior person on the team. I'm sure he was very high up, but uh, uh, he wanted to slow down on the on the camshaft work, right? Soften, soften up the cam a little bit. They had gone pretty aggressive to, to make these numbers, but uh, push rods were, were flexing and all sorts of things were going crazy. And uh, he pushed and pushed to try to make uh, a lighter camshaft, a softer camshaft. Uh, you know, what was the story behind that? Well, uh, the gentleman that you're speaking of, uh, Jeff Williams, if I were to cast a movie and need a, a British professorial type, mm -hmm. uh, he's, he would be typecast. He just, he's just this very smart mathematician. Uh, and he and Mario Illion were very much uh, knocking their heads together. Mario believed they need to be more and more aggressive, which is... Typical for yeah. racing. Yeah. Jeff argued that uh, the system was too highly stressed that you needed to, to back off of certain parameters. Um, Mario, basically, uh, because he's the ill of Ilmore, he had his say, but Mario <laughs> also yearly took a two-week ski vacation. So when Mario left for his ski vacation, Jeff and some of the engineers got together and said, well, Mario's gone, let's at least try it. And uh, so they, they put the, uh, the, the new uh, details into the engine, the new format, and uh, within moments of on the dyno, uh, what had been 850 horsepower suddenly uh, exceeded 1000 horsepower and uh, it had been unlocked. The power had been unlocked. And so it was kind of a magical moment. And that, that moment on, from that moment on, they never again tried to gain more horsepower. The only focus from that moment was then reliability. Let's make it last 500 miles. And as you talked about earlier, that didn't happen until well into the start of practice at Indy. So it was uh, a lot of guys chewing a lot of fingernails uh, nervously with uh, with this engine. Uh, was it going to last? Was it going to make it to the finish? Yeah, the um, and even the um, you know, the, a lot of the folks here that are watching this, you know, we, we understand, but some people wouldn't. It's uh, running this thing on a, uh, on an engine dynamometer is, is sitting there running is it can only go so far in creating these, these stresses that motorsports creates. And um, so they had to get it in the car and they were, they were running. There was a, there was one example, I think in the book, and maybe you can even recount a couple of other ones where, where one of the drivers, I, I think it was Al Jr. In this case, they uh, they ran at a race and they were on private, uh, you know, the, one of the uh, the crew guys and the engineer and, and Al Jr. on a private plane heading. And on Monday morning, they were running laps, uh, you know, trying to, you know, these reliability runs and and uh, just an amazing, amazing amount of work. The um, uh, there was a lot of uh, very, very cool things you've added in there of of not just the bigger picture of reliability, but 
but small pieces, right? The the piston pins and the pistons and the, you know, and some of this stuff is a carryover from stuff they already knew, crankshafts and others, but they had they had narrowed sure. up the angle. They had all these things which added more stress and and uh, <clears throat> and created these issues that uh, they were trying to work their way through in such a short period of time. Very interesting. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So then um, now they get it into the car, right? And uh, and they're they're out there running and they get they're going to go to uh, uh, the month of May starts in Indianapolis. And, uh, uh, and while I haven't reread the book deep enough to know the, um, the, the, the speeds were, were huge, right. On the straightaway. And, uh, because they're uh, 1,024 horsepower is what I think that number was at the, at the end. And, uh, yes. they, uh, uh, there, there were, there were drivetrain problems that was creating. There was, uh, somebody told me once, uh, not not you, or, and I don't think I've seen it in the book, but they, you know, there were actually rear tire and, and and wheel. You know, they were they were spinning the tire on the on the wheel that they'd never ex- had happen at a super speedway type. Yeah, level. there's a great story with that. Yes. So they, they uh, uh, go ahead. I was going to say um, they realized one day at practice um, one of the 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 tire techs had started marking the tire to, to line up with the, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, yeah. gone black. Yeah. yeah the and uh, Paul Tracy went out, did a few laps, came in and they realized it had moved several inches, but then they realized, no, yes. it, it was backwards. It, 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 it rotated <laughs> around uh, the entire wheel. And then Rick Mir said, well, how do you know it's only gone around once? And so <laughs> it, uh, it, they ended up going to uh, Tony Bettenhausen had a shop nearby where they had to go sandblast all of the wheels mm-hmm. so that that bead of the tire would have a much uh, stronger connection to the wheel. Um, but that was another fear. Would the Goodyear tires last 500 miles? The engine might have been great, but if the if the tires, if the other elements couldn't handle it, um, you know, th- there were so many treacherous elements and, and things that worried them uh, from from that moment. But uh, I love that story of Mears saying, well, how do you know it's only gone? Only one. <laughs> <laughs> Took it to the next level of everybody's yes. going, oh, my God, you might be right. Uh, the uh, uh, Another one was the transmission, the drive gears and and, and some of the, uh, the parts that they had built. Uh, even the engine manufacturer, you know, uh, one of the Ilmore guys had to redesign a bolt that was holding together the transmission at the last minute. To, that they kept popping the heads off of it. Just little things yes. like that are, are, are so intriguing. The, um, yes. So they get the chassis to the, to the track. They start the month of May. Certainly some sandbagging going on. They, 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 uh, <laughs> they, they, they clearly have the power, but, but uh, uh, it's insinuated uh, and, and I think well known that the, uh, by putting the engine in, it changed a few things, right? They did have to go a little taller and 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 do some different things. And the one that intrigued me, and and you know, we're we're all into thinking uh, aero nowadays. And IndyCar, uh, an IndyCar at Indy is is uh, certainly a huge aero uh, calculation. The uh, that the three drivers, Emerson Fittipaldi, Paul Tracy, Al Jr., they were so fast up the straightaways that they were having to decelerate into the corners. And when you, and when they were having to lift, if not tap the brake, the, 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 the pitch of the car was such that it was, ma- it was moving the aero center of gravity around and the cars were a handful to drive. And, and in the end there, uh, while he's certainly very, very fast and maybe sandbagging some, you know, they, uh, they were not top of the boards uh, all that often. Uh, but uh, the handling was something they were fighting as much as the engine performance, uh, longevity, I should say, not, not performance. Is that, uh, you recall anything about that? Yeah, uh, again, we talked about the fear uh, is part of what motivated them to create this. They feared their competitors would, would do this instead of them. The other fear Roger had was the USAC rule book very specifically said they had the right to change the boost level at any time. So Roger's fear was they'd get there and they would be so far ahead of the competitors that USAC would act would have to to, yeah. to reduce the, the turbocharger boost to the engine. So Roger was adamant that they not do uh, flat out full complete laps. 
So you had them lifting off strategically at certain points. And at that time, there were not as many uh, timing lines at the speedway. They would only measure top speed in one part of the track. So the Penske people were very cagey about uh, lifting off at certain points. Then the data engineers would have to go back with the data, and basically mix and match certain laps to, together to get the, the true potential uh, of the engine. So the Speedway would, would time you at the start finish line. The Penske boys would time at a different part of the track and then match laps or mix laps in order to, to gauge the true performance. So it again, it was always the sphere that Roger had that uh, if they showed their hand uh, that USAC would, would penalize them uh, for qualifying. And even uh, up until race day, they had this fear that they were going to show their, their cards and, and get penalized for it. And one of the stories in the book, I believe, also is that uh, Paul Tracy ends up crashing a car in the, one of the practice sessions just before qualifying. And, uh, yes. and, and you mentioned in the book that the engineers are going back and they're digging in, trying to figure, okay, what happened, right? Did, uh, you know, did, did the chassis mess up on him? Did it, what, what happened? And it, it turns out, and I think this goes to the amount of, uh, of sandbagging that was going on. He had entered that corner that he crashed in 13 miles per hour faster than he had the entire month of May. Uh, yeah. which, which showed how, how much they were holding back uh, the rest of the time. And Paul got just maybe just a little bit, uh, little bit anxious one time and lifted a little too much or something maybe, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and there's a lot that, and me included, that believe that is the highest speed crash in the oh. history of, of the Speedway. Uh, their data showed that he entered the turn at two, uh, 253 miles per hour, <laughs> which is why he hit the, the wall in turn three, continued clear around uh, almost all the way around turn four before the car came to a stop. Oh, so, my goodness. Uh, oh, my goodness. Yeah, it, it was uh, it was rather <laughs> dramatic and uh, knocked Paul out of uh, qualifying. Uh, he suffered a concussion and wasn't allowed to drive for a few days. So, again, just another part of the drama of the month and the build up to the race. Uh, was a 253 mile per hour crash. And then finally coming up towards the race, I, 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 I did read this one uh, little story where they found some oil rings that were, that were uh, <clears throat> the, the manufacturer contacted them and say, oh, you know, there's something about this oil ring we're not sure of, maybe you can swap them, but they'd already had them in the motors. And they, so even that drama was there, they ended up using them because they, the motors had tested so well that the, they ended up using them. There was a lot of drama even during the race. Yeah, that, well, the, the oil ring they discovered uh, the night before uh, the night before carb day, the final practice, and uh, Kevin Walter, uh, the engineer, flew from England to Indianapolis, uh, and literally uh, Roger Penske and Mario Ilian were out uh, uh, on the pit wall there. Uh, uh, between the, the pit lane and the track during practice and he ran across pit lane and was trying to tell them during practice while they're in that little island there uh, and they finally said look let's go to the garage <laughs> this is nowhere to discuss <laughs> this but uh, they they did make the educated guess that it was a very uh, limited problem that the uh, o-rings o or the the rings in the engines were fine and uh, they decided to leave them in. But uh, yeah, it was never ending drama even during the race itself. Yeah, it's a, a fantastic story. I mean, uh, flat to the floor, 100% uh, effort, um, uh, right up to the to the checkered flag. It's just an amazing uh, how, how hard people worked, the the management skills of bringing it all together by so many people. It's just uh, such an interesting story. I'm so glad that you wrote that book. Uh, the book uh, it is still available. I'm going to give you some links in a, in a in a minute, fellas. Those of you watching live and and uh, uh, watching later on YouTube, where you can still get this. I believe it's out in the, in a paperback now from from October. Paperback, so. yeah. Yeah, it's actually sold out in hardcover. So if you have a hardcover, hang on to it. Those <laughs> those are no more. So yeah, no more. But uh, a, a fantastic. I know it's old, and I know it's. But but the story is just timeless. And I and uh, uh, it's it's. Uh, I've mentioned it a couple of times to other folks, and certainly in the last week when we were talking about this webinar, that it's. Uh, 
I've got a whole shelf of uh, uh, of books, and it is it is the top one or two of all of the ones that I have. I really, really en- enjoyed mm-hmm. the book. Uh, but I did want to chat about uh, another one that you have coming up. I've left it on the screen here for for a while just to uh, so I could remember it to, to chat about it. But Alan Sir Jr., a checkered past. It's a it's a book that's coming out on Friday. The uh, I did uh, order it a month or two ago in pre order. I was hoping it would show up before we before we got here so I could take a look and yeah. uh, and talk <laughs> intelligently about it. But the um, uh, how did that come together? It's a it's a it's a fantastic story, obviously, and uh, and something that needs to be told. And uh, and I'm glad that uh, um, uh, Alan Sir Jr. is telling it and uh, as told to Jade. It says, uh, give us a little bit about that book and what people can expect. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I go way back with Al. Uh, when I was at Ilmore, he was with Penske. Uh, and then obviously Beast, he was, uh, you know, he and I spent some time uh, together on that as well, since he was the driver that yeah. was, uh, you know, drove across the finish line first. Um, but uh, I had done uh, the John Andretti book uh, with John before he passed. And it turns out that uh, the Andretti family attorney also happens to be Al Jr.'s attorney. Oh. And uh, Al had decided the time was right to finally tell his story. And Al had even taken some online classes, uh, how to write a book, oh. uh, and had started that process and finally realized it was just, it was a little bit too big for, a, you know, someone that was a rookie at, at writing a book. And uh, so his attorney said, well, you know, Jade, we worked great with Jade on the John Andretti book. You should you should reach out to him. So um, so that's what happened. They reached out and I I couldn't have said yes fast enough. Uh, He has such a unique story that I I was thrilled that they asked me and we actually we began uh, working on it uh, right away. And and so it was a. a year plus of uh, of working on it, so uh, I'm like a kid before Christmas uh, with it coming out here in the next couple of days uh, to uh, see you know see what the reaction is. What's the it's, basic flow um, of the book? Obviously, a successful racer, but um, yeah, <clears throat> he talks about the checkered well, past and, and, and some yeah, issues he's had in um, life. If if you you know about Al's story, if you read the tabloids, uh, Al was an incredibly successful racer, but Al had some demons and had a uh, substance abuse uh, issue with uh, drugs and alcohol, and uh, has been through some incredibly rough times uh, through uh, arrests and, and other uh, terrible things in his life, uh, loss of his uh, wife and family. Uh, and uh, he kind of hit bottom, had a suicide attempt, and uh, a lot of that had been uh, basically kept secret um, from his fans and from the public. And he decided, you know what, now is the time to tell my story, to tell the truth, to um, share my story, to help others that may be fighting or struggling with it. So it is a book that, that has brilliant stories about the Unser family, great hilarious stories about his family and about Al's early career. Um, you get an intense description of the 1989 500 in which he and Emerson Fittipaldi had that very famous crash uh, and Al ended up giving him uh, the thumbs up and clapped for Mo on the next lap around. Well, there's a lot of backstory to what uh, what was really happening versus just what you saw of him giving the thumbs up. Um, there's a backstory of Beast, uh, obviously, and then the next year when Penske failed to qualify for the 500, uh, those stories have never been told, and it's immense. Uh, the drama of that uh, there's two chapters about their failure oh, in 95 okay. to qualify so uh you have all of that followed by um, this brilliant career this successful driver this multi-time champion uh suddenly begin to to slip from the top and, and begin to struggle with uh 
with substance abuse and, and things in his life. And so the, basically the second half of the book is, is that is how he, um, how he survived, how he came through these unbelievable setbacks uh, to now being, uh, uh, you know, uh, engaged again, he's in a great spot. Uh, he's kind of come back into racing and, uh, so it, it's going to be a, a racing book like no other, both the, the highs and the lows. So very, very uh, good. That's my my lengthy elevator speech about. It. <laughs> <clears throat> I really, really look forward to reading it. He's a. It was the era I grew up watching IndyCar at that a lot at that point, and uh, and, and his skills and coming from sprint cars as a my gosh, I think at the time very, very young. Right nowadays, they're 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 running a lot of them are that age, but. But, uh, yes. you know, 14, 15 years old out there running around in that and then the, 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 the Can-Am cars and, uh, and some of the stuff that he did. And, and of course, the, the IndyCar, um, you yes. know, uh, uh, process that he, you know, uh, career he had was it was amazing. Uh, so glad yeah. to hear that, uh, that you did that. And so and uh, and so glad to hear you talk about uh, it has helped him and maybe talking about it has helped him you know, put that, yeah. uh, some, some of that behind him and get the, get the help that he needed. And maybe it's the mental help that he needed to talk about it. And, and, uh, and I'm sure that it's good. And, uh, and, uh, and we wish him the best. Yeah, absolutely. It, it really has been a, a cathartic element for him to share a lot of that. Um, and uh, he really, uh, I think has, I think it has been great for him, great healing to share it. Uh, there were times when we'd have to stop. It just was oh. so emotional for him to tell tell certain elements, and uh, uh, you know, and again, that was part of it. Uh, really, uh, was was cathartic for him, and I think has helped him, and and will uh, continue to help him in the future. And how was uh, not not really meaningful to the to the end book, but uh, how how do you do something like that? Was there a lot of of Zoom, or was there was there one on one? Did you meet him up with him, or how did you how did it, you actually put all that together in this time we, of viruses? We we met initially. Um, he was in, I'm based in Charlotte. He was at the VIR, which is about two hours up the road. So while he was there, we got together and met. And then he lives in Indianapolis now. So just like the technology we're using today, we ended up using uh, Zoom. Uh, I would record those discussions. We had a couple of days that we went four or five hours, which yeah. was wonderful. But uh, then I'd have to go back and transcribe it, which was very, <laughs> very slow going. It's, uh, you know, the uh, uh, nuts and bolts of, of doing this sort of thing. And uh, so we have... Uh, uh, many, many hours of discussion uh, recorded and transcribed, and that, that's how we put it together. And uh, yeah. uh, so it actually worked out pretty well. You know, modern technology making things possible that, uh, that yes. uh, may not have been before. Absolutely. Uh, very, very good. The, you mentioned uh, briefly the John Andretti uh, Racer uh, book that you also have available right now. What's the, what's the story about that? Is it just a life story or what? Uh, I have not uh, seen anything yeah. about that one yet. It's if 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 you knew John, you love John. He was just an amazing human being, um, and I I wouldn't say I was close friends with him. I came across uh, John uh, during my Budweiser days with Dale Jr. Dale Jr. got burnt badly in a sports car crash, so John was a backup driver, relief driver, and I just really enjoyed him and realized what a great storyteller he was. And like I say, I, we weren't close friends. We would, you know, stay in touch. And mm -hmm. then he uh, was diagnosed with colon cancer. And I kind of kicked myself because it didn't strike me right then. But uh, uh, about a year before he passed, it just, it struck me like lightning that, oh my God, here's a guy that is a great storyteller who's very ill and that this is somebody I need to work with. So I reached out to John and, um, he uh, lives near near here on uh, Lake Norman, uh, outside of Mooresville. So I would go up uh, and sit with him in his his home, and uh, we would do do our interviews. And uh, we were about uh, ninety percent through with the book when he finally was just uh, too ill uh, to continue. So uh, uh, 
So it was, uh, it was a very emotional, very sad time, uh, but we were able to, to finish it with the help of his, his family, his wife, Nancy, and his kids. And so um, it, it was a very emotional program, progress, like kind of like with Little Al. Uh, and John, is, he was so philanthropic. He did so much for so many people uh, that, uh, it just, it, it's a very heartwarming book with a very serious and rather, uh, dramatic ending, obviously very yeah. emotional. Sadly. And he was, but he was very public about the, the process because he knew it could help people. Yes. And, uh, and, and yeah. that was one of the things that I came away from it with. And, and Matt, uh, over in our chat box, just, uh, the, the check it for Andretti foundation. There's a link there and we'll, we'll include yes. it, uh, uh, in our in the YouTube description as well, where you can uh, uh, find ways uh, and help you get uh, get checked, get every everybody yeah. get checked. And the ten percent of proceeds from the book go directly to oh. uh, not to that foundation, but to the Riley Children's Hospital oh, okay. uh, in Indianapolis, which he was very involved with. Okay. So, uh, uh, so yeah, if you purchase Racer, a uh, portion of that will go directly to the Riley uh, Children's Hospital. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you very much for that. The mm -hmm. um, the the last thing I would like to chat about you with is is how. Well, I, I knew of your name and I, uh, just a little bit of just in passing, obviously, uh, had heard about what you you do. But um, one of the things that I wanted to chat about, and, and uh, I'll just bring it up here on, on, the, on our last slide, was the Dale Jr. Download podcast the, uh, about three or four weeks ago. Uh, uh, by the way, for uh, those of you that are watching, it's... Um, I'm not a huge podcast guy, but I, uh, but I do in, enjoy them. And Dale Earnhardt Jr., to me, uh, th there was just a, a while there. And then all of a sudden, the, I, I started seeing the YouTube clips and then the, uh, the of pieces of them that he puts on YouTube. And then uh, you go, go in there. They're, they're, they are extremely well done. They're a long form uh, discussion, right? I mean, I think you were, I think the total podcast here of uh, that I've got linked here in on this document that you can download uh, if you're watching this later in YouTube and click on it or just go search for it yourself. I think uh, yes, it was a little over two hours or something, but I think your piece of it was maybe an hour and a half or an hour 45, something like that. Yes. Um, yeah. He does such a fantastic job and, and um, uh, with, the, with the way they've put them together <laughs> and then your discussion, and I mentioned to this to you a little bit yesterday that uh, I found, I, I listened to most of them and I, and I found that one to be extremely interesting to me because it was the three people he, he's got a uh, uh, what's the fellow's name do you remember uh, uh, Mike, Mike, Mike Davis, Mike Davis oh, uh, who, yeah. who was there with him and uh, a very intelligent guy and very a uh, uh, ton of background in motorsports as well and um, I think you worked with him or brought him in or something at the time so yeah. you know him well the uh, but yeah. the three of you had a, had, a, had a history and uh, uh, of working together in this highly stressed world of motorsports and um, what I found so interesting about it was was uh yeah there's stories and there's there's interesting things to talk to racers about and stuff but uh you guys were reliving uh, tasks that were very very hard very stressful very uh, difficult to do some very fun and very uh you know filled with a lot of laughter but uh being able to really re uh, relive those and chat about them i always find is just so amazing in motorsports it is a uh, one of those areas where you look back i look back you know 20 years ago where i was working with people through an entire season and you, you work hard and you, you either have success or you don't. It happens. Uh, certainly, we all want that success. But you remember the, the, the hard work as much and are so proud of that that you forget some of the hard stuff, right? And that's what you guys were chatting about. And I found it to be such a, uh, such a fun and uh, uh, truly emotional and, uh, uh, and heartfelt uh, uh, session. I hope everybody will go and listen to it. Chat a little bit about what, uh, you know, maybe how you got to got to come back and, and meet with him. It was surprising to me that he says, uh, as you start, that uh, you guys hadn't chatted in a while. And then uh, anything you, th you thought about the, the podcast? Did you have a good time? Oh, I, it was wonderful. And, and uh, you mentioned Mike, the co-host. He was kind of my protege. So really, the three of us have had a great relationship. Yeah. Um, and we, we stayed in touch, but with the, the pandemic and all that, uh, you know, it's it's hard to sort of stay uh stay in touch but we you know through email and text we we kind of occasionally uh, 
get together. And Mike Davis and I were chatting about another project and suddenly he said, Hey, what, you know, why don't you come on the, <laughs> yeah. the podcast? And I was like, Hey, you just tell me when and I'll be there. So it was, it was three good friends, uh, bullshitting and telling stories about exactly. each other. And so it, it couldn't have been more fun. And even, and, and what I, to watch the faces as you're, as you're doing it right uh, on the YouTube side, you can see the video as well as you guys are chatting and to see somebody not remember something. And then the, the story starts. Oh, I do remember <laughs> yeah. that. Right. And it's like, Oh, I can't yes. believe I did that kind of thing. Right. And uh, so it's wide open and, uh, and, and it's fun. And that's the way Dale Jr. Does all of those. You have to be very, very proud of him. I know you worked with him when he was oh, young yeah. and, uh, and, and from what I can tell, I don't know him uh, have huge respect, but uh, very, very quiet and, and shy type early. And then, uh, and he has became such a, uh, um, uh, so very good at this along with, of course, the, 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 the TV part that he does, uh, you gotta be pretty proud of him. Yeah. Oh, I, I told him on the podcast, I, I feel like a proud older brother. I always tease him about that, but um, he, he always had this in him and it's brilliant to see it come out. And, you know, he's happy with his life and his family. And I just, I couldn't be happier for him or more proud of him. So yeah, it, it's wonderful to see his continuous growth. Great, great guests that he has on there, and, and they do a lot of them. And uh, everybody, if you if you have a chance, go uh, just do a quick search for it, uh, or uh, take a look at the uh, I've I've linked directly to Jade's uh, Jade's episode there. Uh, take a look. I think I think everybody will enjoy it. I um, we're going to kind of start to to wind this one up, but I, I sure appreciate. It. And by the way, the uh, I watched that version, and I thought to myself. Uh, you know, Jade was so good on that. I don't know Jade, but then Jade doesn't have any idea who I am. I did a, you know, that five minute quick little search and I found a website with a, with an email link and, uh, and I threw an email and he, within an hour, uh, immediately answered back and said he would love to come and join us. So I hope, uh, uh, we, number one, we thank you. And I hope, uh, I hope everybody here is enjoying it. It's a bit, it's been, uh, a little bit of a selfish thing for me. I enjoy this kind of stuff, uh, the IndyCar side and, and, and some of the stuff. So I've enjoyed it, but I hope everybody else is enjoying it as well. So thank well, you for thank coming. You. Yeah, the, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic day. The, uh, uh, this this um, uh, will also be, as all the rest of ours, will be, uh, is being recorded and we'll place it up on our YouTube site, the AIM YouTube site, uh, currently up to about 178 videos. And we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll continue to place everything that we do uh, out here during these webinars and, and, uh, and have them placed up there. This was, a, this was a special one for me. So the... Um, uh, uh, we we're always out there. Those of you that are watching and uh, and, and looking for AIM support, um, we are a customer support company that happens to sell racing electronics, is what we like to say. I was at uh, Daytona this last weekend at the the NASA Nationals, had a great time. And uh, the weekend before, ironically enough, as this we're talking about this, but uh, I was at the Portland IndyCar race, where uh, our uh, our AIM hardware is in uh, in every IndyCar as far as their uh, their their personal cameras up above the roll hoop. And uh, so we were down there taking care of the IndyCar uh, and, and the Indy Lights programs uh, teams and then helping them. And uh, so we really enjoy that. Um, but uh, look for us. If you can't find us, 800-718-9090. Give us a holler if, uh, and we'll take care of, uh, help you take care of your issues. So what is next week? Next week is going to be something we don't do very often, but uh, we have a new product and uh, want to chat about it. And it's, uh, we call it the SW4, the AIM steering wheel. And uh, it is a fantastic piece of equipment. My, uh, um, one of my coworkers, Robbie Yeoman is going to be joining us. We're going to talk about, you know, how this thing is different. I mean, it is uh, amazing with all of the buttons of course it's got the display on it with the shift lights and the warning lights and the shift paddles can be added and it clutches and and all the dials and the buttons uh and it's a and it uh, can be the data logger as well so it's a it's an amazing piece uh that uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about next week just uh I, uh we've only been out with it for a for a month or month or so and uh love to have everybody understand that it's out there in case it's an option for for some of you building new cars over the winter so we'll talk Talk about that next week. The um, a little bit of contact information. To anybody wants to get a hold of Jade and, and find some more, the, the best way to get a hold of him is uh, is how Jade. Um, 
best bet easiest is i'm on twitter uh, quite a bit uh you can reach out to me there if you have other questions or just want to talk racing uh there'll be a, a quite a bit about al jr's book now that it's coming out this week we've got a lot of uh, interviews and things coming up about that i am so looking forward to that and i uh i've been looking forward to this for the for the three or four weeks that we've had it under schedule and uh you know the beast has been a has been one of my favorite books i've been so so glad to be able to reread it again and then chat with you about it uh, uh, have had a very, very good time. Thanks again for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, hope everybody enjoyed yourselves listening. Um, look forward to seeing everybody here again uh, next Tuesday. So everybody have a great, uh, great rest of your week. Uh, and we will see you, uh, see you on Tuesday. Thank you again, Jade. We appreciate it very much. I appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Good night, everybody.